This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Nier Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel, and the Israel Institute, enhancing knowledge and study of modern Israel. I'm Gilad Halpern. And I'm Dalia Shenlin. I'm your co-host together with Gilad, and we'll be talking every week about books and ideas and other things that influence our lives. Our guest today is a Middle East scholar at the Swedish Defense University and the author of a new book entitled Gaza Under Hamas, From Islamic Democracy to Islamic Governance, that was recently published in English by I.B. Taurus. Dr. Bjorn Brenner, hello and welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. I want to ask about why, what you're really covering in this book. This is a book about Hamas and their internal governance and the tension between a political revolutionary movement or military revolutionary movement, some people would call it a terror movement, and a political governing movement. Which is it mostly now? How would you characterize Hamas? Well, perhaps I should start by saying and a few words about where I'm coming from. And I'm coming from a small fishing village in the south of Sweden, where we live quite far from conflicts like the one in Israel with the Palestinians. So to me, at first, this was a uh, an interesting project, my PhD project, to understand more about the world, basically, and to leave my small fishing village. To come here, of course, had my interest was connected to other things as well, and it was connected to my neighbor in my small village, Guna Yaring, at the time, who is, of course, the, or was the mediator of the 1967 uh, war between uh, Israel and... and uh, yeah, the first international the diplomat trying to resolve the conflict post-1967. He was the one who made me, inter- made me interested in, in this conflict from the beginning. And so, yeah, so returning to your question, what is Hamas? My main interest was to, when researching this and, and uh, writing this book, was to see if there is anything more than violence to Hamas, because this has been one of, of the main arguments at least uh, 10 years ago. Is there something more than violence? And, and in that case, what? In other words, the main argument 10 years ago was that Hamas is a simple terror movement and that's it. And you're saying what else is behind it? Especially because at this point, Hamas has been governing de facto in Gaza for over 10 years. So what have you found? Yeah, it was around the time that Hamas became a political movement, a full-fledged political movement. Yeah, so... The interesting question is, of course, what is it more to more than violence to Hamas, and and uh, perhaps uh, is it different things? Like, is there any democracy inside Hamas? We, of course, on the outside, believe that it's an Islamic movement. How Islamic is it really? And these kind of questions interested me. And uh, how, how would you define, for the purposes of your endeavor, political Islam in its Palestinian form, which is Hamas, is essentially what it is. What, what is political Islam? Well, political Islam, of course, in its broader sense, is uh, the belief that Islam should be a part of both the social sphere and the political sphere. And in the Palestinian arena, to me, in my research, it kind of it changed while I was doing the research what it meant. In the beginning, I only had this general understanding of political Islam. And then, during my research, I started to see it more as an identity, as a a cloak, uh, identity, um, to make a group stronger, so to say. So is it like a, a sheen of sorts? Is it just like lip service? We are Islamic... Do you see what I mean? I see what or, you mean. Or, or is no. it something that's more authentic than that? What do they mean exactly by making Islam part part of politics in real so, terms? So if we talk about Hamas, Hamas in the leaders, the members in their private lives, I would say they are definitely religious and Islamic individuals or religious individuals. In their political life, I think they believe that they are also pursuing Islamic values, but actually their interpretation of what political Islam is or what Islam in politics is, is super flexible and super broad. Is it fair to say that it's even evolving? 
Yes, perhaps, but I think this we have to see on a on a broader on a longer uh, term uh, perspective, maybe. But I will also just add that um, that I interviewed. I had one question that I asked uh, Hamas leaders when I interviewed them that I always asked them, and and I would uh, ask them. So, what is Islam to you? What is Islam to Hamas? And many would smile and look at me, and they would said. Islam is everything that's good for you. <laughs> What's not good for you is not Islam. And it kind of captures how they see, of course, Islam and what you could do with Islam, how you can bend. It seems the, rather all-purpose. So it's all-purpose. It's more of an identity cloak. So this is why I was wondering in the theoretical approach that you take, you make the case that in typical theoretical understandings, at least in Western portrayals, there's sort of a binary opposition between Islamic theocracy on the one hand and secular democracy as if they're totally opposed. And you say it's not really sufficient for explaining at least Hamas. Can you explain why you think it's not a sufficient approach, this binary division? What I'm discussing in in the book is that the understanding of Islamism and what happens to Islamists in power is that we tend to understand them as either Taliban's or another party in the Tunisian Anada party for example so it's either or it's very black or white and for the research for an analysis it's not a very good starting point it doesn't give you any other alternatives than to place Hamas in either camp if you want to study Hamas so i wanted to open this framework up a little bit and uh, and just say at least theoretically that there could be other types of islamists as well when you come to power you don't either have to be just moderated by your experience and leave your ideals or instead just change the the state that you've taken over into a sharia state maybe okay. there are a lot of things in between there as well are there any circumstances that are really unique and specific to the Palestinian case? I mean, I'm assuming the answer is yes, being, you know, the conflict and the occupation and other issues that really preoccupy Hamas and the Palestinians in general. But do you see patterns in this form of political Islam that are really unique and specific to the Palestinian case? I think what's uh, what's unique is is perhaps its flexibility and that it can be interpreted to almost anything and used for the purposes and what's needed at the time. But this also is the the Muslim Brotherhood, a broader way of relating to Islam, that it should be reinterpreted for every new generation. It should be adapted to the circumstances. So it's not really anything new in that sense. It's just that Hamas is doing it to the fullest extent. Let me ask you something. I think that people really are wondering whether Hamas being in this de facto power situation in Gaza is becoming more pragmatic and more moderate in Hamas terms, whatever Mm. that means, or not. You know, over the last few months or even year, analysts on the ground say Hamas is becoming more authoritarian. But on the other hand, there are also these pragmatic statements that seem to accept the reality of two states, this new charter. Mm. Which is the overriding direction that Hamas is taking? Yes, it's a good question. Let's take the charter as an example. So, and maybe explain for our listeners what the charter Yeah, is. so Hamas's first charter was published in 1988, and it holds very extremist language about, um, about uh, what to do with Israel, even anti-Semitic language and so on. It's very extremist. Then comes nothing for several decades, and when... I interviewed Hamas leaders about why there was no revision of their charter. They would say, well, you know, the first, uh, the existing charter is actually only a historical document and you have to just listen to assemble the statements of the current leaders and this is our charter for the time being. And between the lines, you can read from an answer like that, of course, that they were not able to pull together to agree within the organization to create something new to revise what they had, the old document. And then now, in 2017, there comes a new charter. And it shows that they've been working on this for at least two years. 
criticism from the outside, of course, of, of this charter is that uh, so all of the changes that we see that some of us would interpret as pragmatic, as moderating, for example, recognizing the 1967 borders and, and uh, such things. Even if we would call, let's say that we would call that cosmetics, still the fact that Hamas managed to pull together to doing several years in secret between the different parts of Hamas, the prisons, Gaza, the political office in Doha, the diaspora, work on this, pass notes back and forth, discuss, revise, and the conclusions or the, the new charter, what's in it, it's very controversial inside the movement as well, but still all were able to agree on this. It means that Hamas is not an outdated dinosaur or a dying dinosaur. It's actually managing to still keep, to stay relevant in the conflict and that it wants to and that it can. But isn't that essentially at the end of the day just a game? I mean, as you said, because their ideology is so pliable, is so adaptable, is so flexible, isn't, you know, the charter meaningless in practical terms? Isn't it just a charade, all those big ideologues thinking they are big ideologues just trying to explain and justify what they do to themselves? Politics is a game. <laughs> and it's a game for our normal, so to say, politicians. And it's a game for groups like Hamas. There is nothing different between different political actors in this sense. But you have to look at political statements and political acts in a different way. I mean, you, you have to see them as it's part of a game or part of a game, maybe not the good uh, word to use, maybe let's say power struggle instead. And then in this dynamic, as an analyst from the outside, how would you interpret it? Well, when I see the uh, new charter, I don't look at the content. I look at the actual practice of getting it into place and it's not possible to dismiss it as nothing they managed to do it so it means something do you think that this is really the key to hamas's popularity as opposed to fatah's you know their ability to reinvent themselves and therefore be constantly appealing to a wider public to the different generations i think the reason to why hamas is still quite popular and has been popular for a long time now. They have around 30% of the support of the Palestinians. Fatah has around 30% as well. It's not because of that. It's because of that Hamas has made a thing out of staying pure, so to say, or what they call themselves, that they call themselves pure. And they have not compromised with their ideals. They have not negotiated with Israel, at least not openly. <laughs> Uh, they have not approached uh, those who have in this. That so when, would be fact. When you say pure, you're not talking about pure, not corrupt, because many of us think that they were largely elected in 2006 because they were the clean alternative yeah. to Fatah. Does that play no, into yeah, it? That, that, of course, plays very much into it as well. Still 10 years on? Yes, it does. And I still think that Hamas is uh, at least, well, it's definitely viewed as more clean, among the Palestinians. My best guess is that it is also <laughs> in this sense, at least when it comes to corruption. Well, so maybe now is the time to discuss <laughs> Hamas's opposition, not from Fatah, but from the other side, or the Salafists mm. and uh, Islam, more hardline Islamic groups within Gaza that actually charge Hamas with the same things that Hamas charged its secular o uh, opposition before. How do they deal with that challenge? Let's begin by just explaining a little bit what's going on inside Gaza. So Hamas is, of course, in 100% control of the security situation. In this sense, these smaller um, splinter groups or Salafi jihadi groups, they don't pose a strategic threat to Hamas. What does that mean? They but, don't pose a political threat? No, no sir. So what I mean with strategic is that they don't pose a threat in terms of being able to overthrow Hamas or challenge them on their overall authority. But as you say, they challenge Hamas on what's even more important to Hamas, namely its Islamic credentials. In this sense, they are a strategic threat. And they're also a strategic threat in that they could set off a downward spiral of 
violence with Israel of a military escalation. And then, as we know, Israeli Air Force will bomb Hamas infrastructure and Hamas will suffer. But how when do they do it if Hamas at least you know, has the pretense of saying that they remain pure and loyal to their ideology? How do... How do the Salafists... What kind How do of they chan- claim more religious yeah. purity mm. than Hamas? Why do they say that we are the guardians of Islam more than Hamas is? Or is Hamas not such a great guardian of Islam? Many more extreme Islamists would argue that Hamas is not such a good guardian of Islam and of being pure in a religious sense and in a non-corruption sense as well because Hamas entered into politics in 2006 and that was agreeing with indirectly with the Oslo terms and being part of a system that was established by partly by Israel and the PLO. Right. So moving from this revolutionary movement to into the game of politics that you were talking about before, I want to ask you a little bit more about what's going on inside Gaza day to day. Your book is really about how Hamas governs. What is life like for regular people? Why do 30 percent support it? And if 30 percent support it, 70 percent, I guess, do not. And then also maybe if you can tell us about your experiences there. You lived there for months. You interviewed many of these people. What is the day-to-day reality like? I spent several years in Gaza. I stayed with... Years, mainly, excuse me. Yes, yeah, years. Yeah, I spent uh, several years. I stayed with uh, mainly one Palestinian family. And I was part of everyday life of the neighborhood, the community. I moved around freely to the south, to Rafah, up to the north, to the border in the refugee camps in, for example, Shate refugee camp where the then leader Ismail Haniyeh was living. I went to the mosque to pray and to listen to the sermons in Friday afternoons. So I saw a lot. And Gazan, life for Gazans, there are many worlds in one in Gaza. And this connects also to your former questions about the Salafi jihadis. The Salafis were not liked by Gazans in general, and they were living, and they are living, separated to other uh, parts of society and parts of the normal Gazan, so to say. They also have different neighborhoods and, say, segmented society. So as a foreigner, I would enter out and in of these different parts, and I would see things... Please specify, <laughs> no, because it is so much to well, to, When you, when you uh, interviewed the Hamas of operatives, some of them are very senior. How suspicious were they of a Swede coming from a small fishing village in the south of uh, Sweden, going in there to do research? They are pretty suspicious of foreigners, especially Westerners, aren't they? How difficult was it to get access to the inner circles of Hamas? Yeah, of course. I'm not sure that they were aware of that I came from a small fishing village <laughs> in South Sweden. They were aware of that I was a PhD student coming from a Swedish university. and Which isn't much better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the relations with Hamas, or with entering Gaza was not very problematic now it has changed. It's more difficult for people who are not humanitarian aid workers to, or journalists to move in and out. Why because of Hamas or Israel? Now I'm talking about Hamas and the Hamas checkpoints and Hamas Ministry of Interior, how much surveilling they are of, of people coming in and out. Why but has it gotten worse? I don't know. Because of the situation, because of most likely because Hamas is feeling more pressured and less a little bit less in control of what's going on and they believe that they're more paranoid perhaps they think that they're being infiltrated from the outside but gaining access in Gaza was very much about gaining the trust of people I didn't come to tell people what I thought and tell them what to do I came as an observer so I would sit down with people and it could be a minister it could be a clerk in one of the ministries it could be with the women at home in, in the houses and just ask them, so how do you use these things? How What have you experienced? What do you do, for example, if someone has stolen your car? Who do you turn to? Do you turn to Hamas police or do you go to the family elder in the neighborhood? And what do people do? Well, it showed that in the beginning, and this connects also to your earlier questions about so what became of Hamas rule. It didn't end up in a Sharia rule or an Islamic state. What happened in in Gaza rather was that Hamas 
kept the secular system of the Palestinian Authority. Then there were a lot of problems with so all the bureaucrats, all the, for example, in the judicial system, all the judges and lawyers and clerks and so on, they went on strike after Hamas took over. So what would Hamas do? Well, they needed to employ new people to handle this. And then, of course, very questionably, well, they hired people who were loyal to Hamas. And then that would be questionable from impartial point of view. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm mean, just curious in terms of governance. I mean, do they collect taxes and pay civil servants and have functioning state institutions? Can they function like a state government? Hamas functions definitely as a, it's a de facto state in Gaza. They have no plans on, in any foreseeable future, fuse with the West Bank. They Okay, so Hamas is in a critical situation, especially now as we are recording this. But during all the years when I was in Gaza and also we can see now they are devising five-year plans for how to continue with their governance in Gaza. So so the, they, the ongoing efforts to reach some so, sort of power sharing with Fatah have not been entirely genuine. No, I would agree to that. You argue well, that both sides were not truly committed to it. Is yeah, but right? we're talking about Hamas. <laughs> I meant Fatah and Hamas, but, not uh, Yeah, no, Israel. no, of course. And Hamas is holding on to Gaza. This is what they have. This is their strategic asset now. If they are pushed out of Gaza, they have nothing else to hold on to in terms of existence and as a physical base. Especially now if they will be pushed out of Qatar. And we'll see where they go after that, maybe to Ankara in, in Turkey. Right. Just to focus a little bit on the very current situation, you know, the electricity crisis is some sort of pressure by Fatah trying to use Israel to pressure Hamas. What is the possibility you say they might be pushed out? How can that scenario happen? If you were a Fatah leader, what would you be imagining might happen as a result of this kind of pressure and weakening that you're talking about? If I was a Fatah leader, I would perhaps believe that Hamas would cave into pressure and that Hamas would agree to some kind of power sharing agreement. This has been tried several times. And, Fata, and it's never worked. It's never worked. And Fatah underestimates the belief within Hamas and the, the, also the, the, the steadfastness, but also the paranoia or the fear of losing control, of not being able to defend themselves and keep their, retain their arms and so on. Well, let's ask a wrap-up question. Do you think that Hamas really has what we consider the basic definition of statehood, monopoly on the legitimate use of force in Gaza? That's what I want to know. That's a 100% yes answer to that. Legitimate, including the legitimate part? But what do you mean with legitimate? Do you mean that they have the respect of the... from within the population. The the exception of the population. Yeah, I mean, respect doesn't have to just be surveys. It means people, A, not actively trying to overthrow them. It also means people believing in the Hamas institutions and taking their orders and following the laws and dictates of Hamas without rebellion, I guess. Well, you have to look at this in in a uh, relative perspective. So Gazans ask themselves, what would be the alternative? If Hamas is kicked out of Gaza or eliminated by Israeli military, what will come in its place? The PA, up till 2006 didn't have any respect at all in Gaza. If you ask Gazans what they did with or how they related to the PA police, for example, they would say that, uh, oh, so when we were stopped at the red light, uh, this is just an interview that I recall just now, we were stopped at the red light by a police officer. He walked up to the car and one of the passengers of the car stepped out and approached the police officer from, from behind and they captured him, they put him in the back of the car and they drove around for a few hours uh, just for fun. You know, this is the kind of non-respect they had for the PA at the time. That would not be what I call the legitimate Um, monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Um, Hamas, at least, and this is one of the things that that Hamas has succeeded with in Gaza, it did reestablish order. Maybe not law and order. In Critical how distinction. We <laughs> no, tr- trains now but, run but on order. time. Yeah. Yeah. But so I have to go back to the first question I think that we asked as maybe our closing question. Do you see Hamas heading overall? You know, if you had to imagine a graph that goes up and down, but what's the basic trajectory? Is it becoming more moderate, more pragmatic, maybe even more democratic, even if not liberal democratic? 
or more authoritarian in the long run, if you can characterize what you've seen over 10 years of Hamas rule, over 10 years of Hamas rule? I've started to talk about Hamas in other terms than talking about it, if it's moderating or not. To me, especially my conclusions after these years in Gaza is that Hamas is a super flexible organization or movement. They open to do anything that they feel can they, they can gain from. And this I think this was the same before. And then they are pushed in different directions connected to the circumstances. So, so what you're saying is that if the circumstances are opportune, they may be flexible in the so-called right direction. Definitely. And take, for example, how they are talking about relations with Israel. They offer what they call a hudna. And the criticism against that is, from our point of view, is that, oh, so a hudna is just temporary. It doesn't mean a final peace. But from Hamas, it's just a way of motivating, from an ideological point of view, and against their own members, why they shouldn't fight Israel. Let them believe that. Let them say to their own that it's just a temporary peace and let the temporary peace continue for a thousand years. Well, that sounds optimistic to me, uh, <laughs> given uh, all things being relative, as you point out. That is Dr. Bjorn Brenner, who is a Middle East scholar at the Swedish Defense University and the author of a very interesting new book called Gaza Under Hamas, From Islamic Democracy to Islamic Government, recently published in English by I.B. Torres. Dr. Bjorn Brenner, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. And also big thanks to uh, Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, and to the Van Leer Institute and the Israel Institute for the generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick. Don't forget to visit our website, like us on Facebook and follow me as well as Dahlia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. <laughs>